um, a conservation charity for the park. And this is part of our friends series of talks and presentations about the rich wildlife and its conservation within Richmond Park. Normally, of course, for those who have been to these before, we do these live and in person uh, in Pembroke Lodge in the park. Um, but this time, obviously, we're having to do it virtually via the Zoom webinar. So um, we hope you enjoy it just as much as you would if you were with us in person. Um, so incredibly, um, I'll just say this word, wow, we had over 350 people register for today, which is remarkable, from as far away as Cornwall. So I hope you're looking after your fungi down there and hello Cornwall. Um, and I know there are quite a number of non-members joining us today. So don't be shy about joining up. It's only 15 quid a year and you can do it on our website. Um, so although I'm a complete fungi novice, uh, I'm sure like me, you have a real fondness for the curious shapes and colors that pop their heads up from the leaf carpet um, at this time of year. You'll probably remember, if you were watching Autumn Watch recently, you may uh, have heard them describe it as, I love this, pinheads of a complex underground system. And more of that later. Fortunately, though, we have someone today uh, who is much more knowledgeable than I am about fungi, and that her name is Janet Bostock. But before I hand over to Janet, um, just a few points I'd like to go to. Hello, Janet. Uh, just a few points I'd like to uh, talk you through. The presentation itself, Janet will first give some explanation of what fungi are, their evolution and their biology, together with some great examples of fungi found in Richmond Park. Then this will be followed by a 15 minute film, our 15 minute film, The Fungi Safari in Richmond Park. And then finally, Janet will talk of the huge ecological value of fungi as well as how essential it is to humans. Um, there will be at the end a Q&A for everybody to, to join in a bit. Uh, we'd, we'd ask you to uh, send your questions to us during the course of the presentation over the next 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, now, you should be able to do this via a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's at the bottom of your screen. It's at the bottom of my screen just there. If you're on a laptop um, or a desktop, or it could be at the top of your screen if you're on a, um, an, I, a, a, an iPad or uh, similar. Um, so a, a tablet, in other words. So we won't be able to answer all your questions, uh, but we hope to be able to get to most of them. We'll see how we go. I just had to say we're very grateful also to Xanthi Jalusi and Roger Hillier in managing today's presentations. Um, they've been handling lots of technical stuff and this is the first um, Zoom webinar we've done. So please be with us um, and be patient with us <laughs> if anything that does go wrong. Hopefully it won't. Uh, the session will be recorded. So um, don't be um, surprised at seeing the recording. And that's really for people who aren't able to join us today. But the recording won't be showing anybody else's faces except for our own presenters. And so to today's presenter, uh, Janet Bostock. Um, many members will know Janet. Um, she's a very familiar face around Richmond Park. Uh, she's, um, she's been a, friends, a member of the Friends for over 20 years, and she's been volunteering conservation work in the park for, I think, 12 years. And for five years, Janet's been supervising that as well. She's passionate about the park's wildlife and her particular interests in birds and, of course, fungi. So, Hello, Janet, again. Hello, hello. Over to you. Right, good morning. Well, as I'm going to wait now for the first picture to appear on the screen. Is the first picture going to appear on the screen? <laughs> Here we go. It be coming. There we go. Um, so, as and we've got some pictures on, so I can minimise those, can't I? Yeah. Sorry, just doing my own stuff. It won't go. It won't go. Okay. Um, as summer ends and flowers fade, we move into autumns, wetter and colder weather. The colourful world of fungi comes to life. And although fungi are there 365 days of the year, we only see them when the fruiting bodies appear for the purpose of propagating their spores. Spores are the equivalent of seeds 
in plants. Next one, please. Next picture, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. I like to think of fungi as winter's flowers. And from this small sample, you can get an idea of their amazing variety of shapes and colors. Some are perennial, like the large brackets, but most are annual. Autumn is the best time to go looking for them, although some do appear at other times of the year. Fungi have evolved in ingenious, have evolved to ingenious ways of ensuring that their spores are spread around. For example, puffing away on the wind from the puffball, smell, strong smelling to attract an animal or an insect to eat, find and eat them like the truffle you see there, or using raindrops to splash out their spores as on this actually named orange peel fungus. But fungi are not only beautiful, they are essential to life. Life on this planet started in water, but more than over 450 million years ago, the first fungi, first fungi and later the ancestors of plants, washed ashore from water onto bare rocky land. Finding food was a challenge, but fungi already had the chemicals to break down rock, so obtaining minerals. In water, roots were not needed by plants. On land, fungi connected with the plant ancestors and algae, becoming the equivalent of roots, scavenging for minerals and water, while the fungi received sugars from the partnership. Next one. The lichens we see today, are often on bare rocks, are a combination of a fungus and an algae or a cyanobacteria, which might resemble some of those early relationships. An important difference between plants and fungi is that fungi have to find food to eat, as we do. Fungi cannot make their own food. Plants and algae have chlorophyll, which enables them to make their own food by photosynthesis, which uses the energy of sunlight to create energy, energy rich sugars from water and carbon dioxide in the air. This partnership and exchange of nutrients, sugar from plants to fungi, minerals and water, and that's important, from fungi to plants, each providing a need that the other can't produce, has continued to the present day as both plants and fungi have evolved and diversified. It is called the mycorrhizal system, whereby plant roots and fungi entwine in over 90% of plants today in a network dubbed the wood wide web. This name was first coined and used on the cover of Nature in 1997, after the World Wide Web had been invented. You might have seen the Wood Wide Web beautifully described recently on Autumn Watch, episode seven. If not, you can catch up. Now, as plants and animals and other forms of life multiplied, they also died, creating a lot of debris. It's organic debris. This is dinner for fungi. They have the ability to break down, digest and recycle the nutrients tied up in any organic debris, releasing carbon, phosphorus and nitrogen into the soil for the next generation of plants to use. And how is that done? Well, fungi are composed of fine tubes called hyphae, which join to make thicker visible cords called mycelia. These tubes exude digestive enzymes, which break down whatever organic material they are living in or, and feeding on. The elements released are both reabsorbed as food for the fungus and some released into the soil. The fruiting body that we see is also made up of these fine hyphal tubes. This mycelium that you see in the picture here was on a log in the park, which I came across. Someone had peeled away the bark, revealing 
the mycelium, which would otherwise have remained hidden, damp and on the move, searching for food. Fungi are the most important organisms able to break down lignin, which is the very tough organic polymer that enabled plants to be stiff and to grow tall. Tree trunks contain a lot of lignin. Some fungi start rotting down the lignin while the tree is still living. This fallen oak on the left in conduit wood was certainly being rotted down by white rot fungi while still standing. In a high wind, it fell. The centre looked like polystyrene. The lignin had been degraded and removed by the fungi, leaving spongy white wood. Red or brown rot is caused by fungi that degrade mostly cellulose, which is the most common substance in plants, but leave much of the dark coloured lignin, which is why you see the brown rot. Damp decaying wood, as in these trees, has a second life, as the wood is soon inhabited by bacteria, insects and other fungi who arrive seeing a des res, ready to be occupied. Fungi are the world's champion, rotters and recyclers, the scientific name being saprophytes, and without their recycling services, we wouldn't be here. The breaking down and recycling of organic material is essential to provide food for new plants to grow. All fungi break down and recycle organic material, which is their food source, but only a few are also mycorrhizal. This young oak will already be connected to and fed by mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, possibly linking it to bigger trees nearby which will help to feed it. So without fungi, our oaks and other trees wouldn't be here in Richmond Park. We need to take notice and value fungi, both the vast hidden underground network and their fruiting bodies, which are the trigger to the next generation. There's a quote here from uh, President Roosevelt. A nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. Forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people. I think they've given us fresh strength during the lockdown. Now, in the film we're about to show you, you'll see me picking a fungus. But I have a permit from the Royal Parks for the purpose of identifying and recording fungi in the park and for educational purposes. We are in a national nature reserve and it is forbidden to pick or take anything from the soil. And that's the end of that. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you, Janet. Uh, th thank you very much, Janet. Um, that's, that's very interesting uh, what you've shown so far. And as you say, in a moment, we'll head off on the fungi safari. Um, just first of all, I've got a quick question for you, if you don't mind. You talked about mycorrhizal, and as you said, it's been um, covered quite a lot recently in, in Autumn Watch and so on. Um, so, the, or, or the wood wide web. So how can we help to look after this underground network of fungi? Well, we can look after it by the thought that if you compress soil, for example, you have a path next to a tree, quite close to the tree. So people or a road, cars are going over it. They're compressing the soil over the roots and fungi and roots need aerated soil. So there's a National Trust place that actually moved a car park because the road went right next to uh, an important oak. So they removed it. If you go to Kew, Kew Gardens, you'll see that around some of the big important trees, they've cleared the grass, they've aerated the soil, and they've put down wood chip. That makes a soft pad. So if people do walk up to the tree, they're not compressing it. Now in your garden, that's big places, but in your garden, you can do something. I or my allotment can do something. It's the no dig. Soil is held together by fungi. So the no dig method, is means don't dig you simply plant and you you take some roots out but you don't dig because by digging you destroy 
the structure of the soil, breaking up the fungi. So that's one of the things we can do. Right, I, okay. shall, I shall remember to do that on my allotment, definitely. Okay. Uh, oh, some and, of the, go on, yes, go, go on. on. Yeah. I was going to say the fences. If you notice in Richmond Park, they've put the uh, rather beautiful fences around some of the big old trees. Uh, the one. Royal Oak. Yes, I had a picture of it before they put the fence round. Um, yeah. But that's to stop people going up to it, to reduce the compression under the root, on the roots. Go on. Your yeah, turn. no, I was just going to make that point and also to say that, um, of course, the French are very active with that and we've been putting funding into fencing to protect against compaction and compression of the older oaks in particular in the park, but all, all the old trees in the park. So that's really good news. So hopefully now we, we should be ready to slot in our uh, fun safari. Autumn brings a wonderful rush of colour to the trees of the park and a natural harvest of acorns, sweet chestnuts and beech mast for the wildlife. As well as acorns and sweet chestnuts carpeting the ground, colourful fungi emerge in the autumn. The park has over 400 species of fungi, many of them rare, including fly agaric. Wild mushrooms and toadstools are not just good to look at. They are another rich source of food for deer, mice, squirrels and insects. They also help to clean up the environment, mopping up bacteria and cleansing soil in preparation for the next year's new growth in spring. We're going into the Isabella, it's a great place to find fungi, one of the best in the park. We're looking at this log here, um, there's several fungi on, but the one I'm going to show you is the lumpy bracket. It's annual, but it's, it survives uh, for another year, but can you see the green on top? That's algae, and there's some bits of moss, because it's rather soft, the surface is soft. This is the underside of the lumpy bracket. It's got a maze-like set of pores, and that's where the spores are produced. And look how it's grown through the grass. The grass was coming up below the log. Now these are very pretty, Janet. What are these? These are a very common fungus that you'll find on logs. It's always worth looking on wet logs. Have to be wet because fungi need water to grow. You can see the bands here of different colours, which is why it's called turkey tail. If you imagine that as the tail of a turkey. One of the reasons I don't like dens in the park is because by stacking logs against a tree, the log dries out and fungi need water. They need wet logs. So we have some very pretty little creamy white well, I've called them mushrooms, but fungi here, Janet. So they're puffballs. They're puffballs, there they're we puff go. They're puffballs. Um, they're not ready to puff yet. Uh -huh. If you look inside there, this is one I've picked, you can see that it's grey, and when it's ripe to puff, that's the ones where you puff them and the, the spores come out, but it's not ready yet. These are growing, and they're recognisable because they've got these spines on. Again, when it rains, sometimes the spines get washed off. But that's recognisable. I like the fact that this one I've picked, can you see the white threads? If I hold it against oh, the yeah, black, yeah. the white threads, that's the mycelium. So as I pulled it out, picked it up, that is hanging out. It's also holding together these bits of debris in the soil because 50% of the weight of this soil is fungi. It's those threads and oh. they're holding everything together. These puffballs are living on the organic debris in the soil and breaking it down and recycling. So, Janet, can you tell us what this beauty is here? This beauty is a hen of the woods, ripple of frondosa. I like the frondosa bit because it's frondy. It's got lots of fronds, 
Uh, it's all one fungus. Underneath it's white, it's got pores, and that's where the spores are produced. It's attached to the base of this oak tree. It's a weak parasite, so it's not good for the tree, but it, it's not causing a lot of damage. The tree can live with it. It's annual, this fungus, but it will, with luck, appear next year. And uh, is it called Hen of the Woods because it's edible? It is edible. I don't like telling people things are edible because nothing can be picked in the park. <laughs> so Janet, the sun's come out and uh, we found something rather interesting here. Can you um, talk us through these lovely fungi? Yes, this is a group of fungus that is fungi that are again on this very old log because on a new log you'll get certain fungi. As the log ages, different fungi will enjoy it for the food source. And if I come down here and show you the stem, did you hear the crack? Yeah. It's a brittle stem. So that's my first clue, both the colour of the spores, they'll be brown, and the fact that the stem is brittle and cracks, that'll help me look in the book to find out what it is. So what's this beauty here? It's a Ganoderma. <laughs> Again, you'll find it at the on wood. Can you put your finger by it just to show the size of it? It's, it's breaking down the log that mm -hmm. it's living on. You'll also find this on trees. It's a bracket fungus. It's a it? bracket fungus, right. yes. Yeah. This one is new, mm -hmm. and this white surface is the growing surface, and the white is also the place where the spores are produced. These are last year's, they're older. So they seem to have stopped growing, but often you get a new layer. You get a new layer each year. Right, and they get really tough. The old ones, really solid wood, wood-like. Really. They're hard. Yeah. Whereas another Ganoderma, the ones on the red oaks, uh -huh. you can do that and it's push your finger in, and it's right. soft. So it's one way of being sure it is that, not this Ganoderma. This just looks like a dead tree stump, but it's it's a bit special, isn't it? It's very special because the fungi are just loving it. So right at the base, if we move around the other side, we've got an array. First of all, we've got a great big beefsteak fungus. This one, the red one. And on the corner there, you can see the dripping blood. It really does look like a piece of beef. Next to it, there's a clump of sulphur tuft. They, they're very common, you see them in lots of places, called sulphur tuft because of the yellowy colour. Another beefsteak coming out, more sulphur tuft. Oh wow, look at that. A fantastic array. Look at that, that's really beautiful. And then round here, this is the next lot of sulphur tuft that's coming. So as the first lot die ones. over, this these the young, are young ones. Right. Further on, we've got yet another fungus. Wow. This is Meripolis giganteus. Here, it's doing no harm. It's Meripolis giganticus. Sorry, oh, giant polypore. Giant polypore, right. It's breaking down this old, the wood in this old stump because fungi can break down lignin. Elsewhere in the park, this is a nightmare because it's damaging red oaks, damaging oaks, all sorts of things. It's a parasite. But at this time in its life, here, it's just breaking down the dead wood and recycling. So doing a good job for once. So Janet, we've already talked a little bit about um, beefsteak fungi, but I, there's something rather special one? about this one, this red one here. Tell this us about one it. is well eaten by slugs and you can see the red juice that exudes from it dripping. Oh dear, it's like very blood. close together, close, you can see the long tubes here because the tubes on this are quite long and the tubes, the, the, the spores are dropped at the bottom of the tubes. Next door to it, we have another clump wow. which is called spindle shank. Spindle shank. Spindle shank. Right. Um, and I'll show you this one in my hands. Um, you recognise it by this fat stem which is then becoming quite narrow at the base, like a spindle. And it's tough. Look at that, the tough texture. So it's spindle shank. It again was under growing as a clump at the base of this oak. It's not doing the, the oak much harm. It will cause a bit of rot. Those white threads are the mycelium. And those spread into the soil 
exude their digestive enzymes, digest all sorts of dead material in the soil, and then reabsorb the nutrients. So they're cleaning up the soil, essentially. They're also some of the nutrients of the debris, like this bit of wood that they're breaking up, will be left in the soil and making it available, making those phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon available to plants. There's the fluffy mycelium. Yeah. Yes. And those mycelium are binding together all these little bits of fragments of wood, debris in the soil. Mm. So that's why they call the fungi the glue of the soil. We've got some very small fungi here called bird's nest fungi. You can, if you look closely, you can see the, what looks like eggs, but that's packets of spores inside. Over there, those round heads, those are ones that are coming. They're going to, the, the top will break open and it will reveal the spores inside. Growing on the wood chip, I pick up this piece of, you can see the mycelium, which are holding the wood together. Came out of the wood that way, then it has, the cap has to be, the gills have to be vertical to the ground. Right. And that's a mycena, is it? That's a mycena. Mm. And that's why it bent like that. It came out okay. sideways, but then it had to turn to make sure the cap, because the spores are made on the side of the gills, but it's got to be, at, those gills have to be at right angles to the ground for the spores to drop. Drop on the ground, right. And we've got a little crop of them down here. A lovely crop of them. Oh, it's really very pretty, isn't it? This is both the remains and the beginnings of a stink horn. The white rocket-like cap is the end of the stink horn when all the black colouring with the spores has been taken away. And if you look at the stem, how open it is, it grows, and there's the slope that's been eating it. It grows very, very quickly because the cells are a large structure. That's where the egg, that's where it came from. We call it the witch's egg. And here, are, there's a big one that's coming, that's going to burst out. They grow very quickly and go over very quickly. Here's a familiar one, the, the parasol. Likes to grow in grassland, pop up all over the park, and as I come down you can see why it's called a parasol, and you can see the ring on the stem. Next door, there's one that's on the ground. This, if I turn it over, you can see the white gills underneath. This, I think the stem had been eaten by slugs. That's why it fell over. So Janet, we've got something rather exciting popping out of the ground here. What's this? I think it's the fly agaric. Ah. The red one, red cap that everybody knows with white spots on it. Called the fly agaric because you can have little pieces of it in a dish of milk and it will kill flies. And there's quite a few around here. There are. Interestingly, this is pushing up through soil. Some fungi push up through asphalt. Wow. So over here, wow, look at this. We've got two here that have got a stage further. They've come above the ground. Uh, and on this one, you can see a slight ring uh, on the stem there at, at the base. Sometimes they're only red because the spots get washed off in the rain. Here's another fly agaric. It's soon going to drop its spores. It's got to open out a bit, flatten out, because the gills, it's got gills underneath, like the shop mushroom that you buy, um, the gills have to be at right angles to the ground, and that's why you have a stalk holding the cap above the ground so that the spores can drop and blow away on the wind. And over here, we've got another one. Oh, yeah. You can see the gills very clearly. And this is getting towards the end of its life. The spores will have dropped and blown away. It's been eaten a little bit by a slug. That's fine, again, it'll, that's spreading its spores. 
So Janet, we're by a, a young silver birch tree here and you found something down here. What have we got? This is a, a rusula, They're also called brittle gills because the gills, actually, if you rub your finger across them, which I'm not going to do because there's only one here, uh, they are very brittle. It's mycorrhizal. So this is the fruiting body, but under the ground, the hyphae, the thin threads, which are like roots of the fungus, are attached to the roots of the birch. The mycorrhizal fungi feed the tree. They take sugars from the tree, but they feed the tree with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The Amanita muscari, which we have been looking at, that also is mycorrhizal, but that's more generalist. It'll be with lots of different plants, lots of different trees, rather. But the russulas, you'll get certain russulas with birch, different ones with oak, different ones with hornbeam or beech. They're often quite particular to where they grow, who they grow with. The birch tree here, and if I come down close to the ground, below the birch tree is a mycorrhizal fungi, a fung attached to the root, which is a belete. It's got pores underneath, and this is a birch belete. You will find it where there are birch trees. It's fascinating, and hopefully everybody enjoyed that. Um, and the videos uh, and the images uh, show the abundance of the fabulous fungi in the park. You can almost smell the autumn richness out in the park. Um, but I'd I think you want to qualify the one particular point that you made in the film. Yes, there's one particular point. When we were looking at the, uh, the puffballs, I said 30% of the weight of the soil is, our fu is fungal. It's not, it's 30%, and it might be as much as 50% of the organic material in the soil. So that's not including rocks. <laughs> so it's a bit less. Interestingly, in the Amazon rainforest, the amount of organic debris, in mainly fungi, can be in the soil, can be as much as 80%, uh, because there everything rots down very, very quickly. So that was one correction. Any others? No, oh, just, just, no. Just, just, while we're, um, just while we're waiting for the next set of slides to be set up, because we've got to final set of slides that last the channel will present will be a, just run for a few minutes. Um, you talk about the giant polypore is a nightmare around the park. Why is that? Why is well, that? the giant polypore is a parasite. So it's mainly on beach, but you do see it on other trees. Right. But if, if you see giant polypore around the base of what looks like a healthy tree, you know that tree is going to soon be going because it's greedy it is mycorrhizal it joins with the roots of the tree but a parasite is something which takes and doesn't give so it takes lots of stuff from the tree lots of sugars um and actually they produce the tree produces lipids fats as well it takes everything it can get and gives nothing back so that's why it's a nightmare but when we saw it round that log okay I think uh, Joe, uh, okay. Roger's, Roger's um, I think he's stopping us from talking here, so uh, he's, he's controlling it. But we've got the second set of slides now coming up, which uh, I'll leave you to, um, to talk us through now, Janet. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, fungi provide an essential source of food for a variety of insects and a habitat for insect larvae, which you can see in the picture on the right. That picture, you can't see the caption. Um, insects uh, pollinate and are food for other insects and animals, so are a vital part of the food chain. A local example, sand martins nesting at pen ponds feed on insects. Recent surveys have shown that there has been a 50% drop in the number of insects in Britain and across Europe in the last 50 years, which is ex an extremely worrying decline. Richmond Park is an important site for insects that live on rotting wood, such as red clip beetles and stag beetles. 
So important, in a future talk, the topic will be insects, because they, like fungi, tend to be ignored, yet they are both an, es both an essential cog in the ecosystem. Next slide, thank you. Um, here, this is my local supermarket, you might have a different one, and the picture on the right is a quiz, really, to search for the fungi in the food. Now, anything which is fermented depends on fungi. So that includes alcohol, coffee beans, cocoa beans for chocolate, soybeans for soy sauce, tamarind in Worcester sauce, and of course, bread. Marmite and Vegemite are made from brewer's yeast. The veins in blue cheese, the white rind on soft cheeses are both caused by molds. If you see citric acid on a label of contents of food, for example, on lemonade, the citric acid has nothing to do with lemons. It is produced using a fungus. Corn is made from a filamentous fungus that is grown on sugar in large vats. And the fungus was actually found in a field in Marlow. And of course, there are fresh and dried mushrooms. The orange in the picture is the odd one out. It has a fungal mold growing on it. Hopefully not to be found in the supermarket, more likely to, pound, to be found in your own fruit bowl. Next one. Next picture, please. <laughs> We've got stuck, there we are. Um, now this is a picture on the right of the Scarlet Caterpillar Club. Um, and I found one of these in the Isabella plantation, living on a buried chrysalis, as shown here. These particular, this particular fungus is found throughout the Northern Hemisphere, but they are particularly used in Chinese medicine. A yak herder on the Tibetan plateau found that they could, he could make a better living while collecting cordyceps than herding yaks. And as a result, they have been almost wiped out from the Tibetan plateau. The Chinese have been using a variety of fung fungi medicinally for hundreds of years. The West is beginning to catch up. You recognize statins and you know of penicillin. The ergot, which I'm sure you've heard of, but the black in the picture there on the ears of the grain, it can be on grass or it can be on barley, or, other, or wheat, that is the fruiting body of the fungus which causes the ergot. The rest of the fungus lives inside the plant and it just fruits when it needs to. So you can find those looking around. Now fungi are mini pharmaceutical factories. Many of the chemicals produced have evolved to protect fungi themselves. Fungi are in their own kingdom but are more closely related to animals than plants. Might this be why some of the chemicals they produce have been found valuable as medicines for humans? Maybe. Fungi not only direct, directly produce substances that humans use as medicine, but they are also a versatile tool in the vast field of medical research. Now we'll look at some other ways in which fungi can be used. The oyster fungus is one of the fungi causing white rot, which was mentioned earlier. It is already being used to clear oil spills. It can also feed on toxic materials, breaking down polluting chemicals. The mycelium will feed on and bind, to bind together wood chip, making packaging. If you call a coffin packaging, um, so my husband was showing me something, sorry. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is now possible, a fungal cough in, in pot, they're making them in Holland. You may have read about a fungus discovered by researchers on a rubbish tip in Pakistan, which can break down plastic. And don't we need some help in that direction? That was a penicillium fungus. Some fungi also have antifungal properties which is not surprising as fungi have been competing with each other for millions of years. Could this property be used to make fungicides for use in agriculture? 
Some fungi prey on insects, like the cordyceps we saw, so might be developed to be used in pesticides. Now, what about building a house using fungal bricks or paddling down the Thames in a fungal canoe or wearing a dress made from mycelium leather? It takes three weeks to produce a fungal leather hide, a fungal hide, rather than three years to rear a cow. The future is your oyster fungus. Yes, Janet, thank you for this fascinating to hear about the incredibly diverse uses of fungi and to understand how important they are um, to, to, to wildlife and especially in the context of Richmond Park. Um, but also fungi's growing importance to mankind as we understand its complexity and biology more um, and all the uses and applications. And I'm particularly intrigued. I have to ask you one question for after the slides you've shown us. So would you choose a fungi coffin to shuffle off this mortal coil, Janet? Yes, I would actually, if it's available, definitely. Because yeah. apparently if you put the body inside a fungal coffin, not only does the coffin rot down, the body rots down more quickly. And if you think of coffins, they've got brass handles and uh, they've got all sorts of finishes on the wood. That's pollutants going into the soil. So it's absolutely ideal to have a fungal coffin. So yes, please, I'll put it in my will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, 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 or start making one, of course. <laughs> say I'm not going to opt for the uh, fungi canoe because I've canoed on the Thames once already and fell in and I'm sure being in a fungi canoe wouldn't help me anyway but uh, it's amazingly okay. it's waterproof so yes incredible Go on. okay so, <laughs> great well um thank you very much um Janet for for the presentation and I'm sure that if people can hear us virtually they'd like to do that first of all thank you it's been terrific so far but looking at um Looking at what I've got down here, which is the Q&A section, there are absolutely loads of questions that have poured in uh, and some rather nice comments as well. So thank you for those. And we'll try and um, we'll try and get to as many of these questions as we possibly can. Uh, we might overrun a little bit uh, beyond uh, half past, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to just make a quick comment to Helen Kahn, who sent in some photos prior to this and asked for some identification. and. We can't do that uh, online today, I'm afraid, but we will drop you an email separately on that one. But to go through um, uh, a few other quick questions, um, our, we're really, uh, Anne Marie Boyd really wants to know if fungi eating dogs eating fungi, if it's at all dangerous to dogs. It's the same as a human eating fungi. Depends what the fungus is. Very few fungi are poisonous. One or two are deadly poisonous, but that's only very few. And as far as I know, the death cap, and there hasn't been seen in the park, and there are some very poisonous cortinarius, and apparently no cortinarius has been seen in the park. And there have been some professional surveys of fungi in the park. But if your dog did, or if as a human, you go and pick fungi, which is not in the park, obviously, and eat them, if you are sick, you should always keep one of the fungi that either the dog has eaten or you have eaten, because then a doctor or somebody, Q actually has a 24 seven identification um, service available wow. uh, if you are seriously ill. And if, you've re if anybody here read the Horse Whisperer, Nicholas Evans wrote the Horse Whisperer, the book, he and his family were regular foragers, so they, in quotes, knew what they were doing. Yeah. But they mistakenly included a quaternarius, which is extremely toxic, in yes. their dinner. And they were fine until about three days later, when they were so ill, they went to hospital, and they, they suffered kidney damage. And I believe Nicholas Evans has now had a replacement kidney. So some fungi are dangerous. Okay. Just keep your dog away from them, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Christian Gastaldello, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, wants to know how many varieties of fungi can be found in the park? The records we've got so far show, um, the last time I looked it was 390 something, but many of them, there'll be more because the recordings are not complete. Another feature is we're only recording the ones we see above the ground. Yes. There are so many more fungi which don't fruit. 
So there are many more fungi than actually you see. Some of three, three, 350, 400. I've got a, a, a good question or a good point here raised by Sandra Hux, and I think it was raised by somebody else, if I can possibly find it, but I might have to move on. So excuse me if I, I don't mention your name. Um, but people suggesting, what about a guide to the fungi in Richmond Park? That perhaps I think that's an excellent idea. Have um, you volunteered yourself? I've just volunteered myself, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and may, maybe the most common 50 or something brilliant. like that. Yeah, with a leaflet. That. Yes, and with illustrations. And all our publications. She, I know she's online. I'm sure she'd be delighted to help out with the print and design. Of it. So thank you. But the much. other thing is also, you get yourself um, a good book. This is a good yes. one. Yes. Um, we were going to mention this at some stage, books to get. This one um, by... Uh, Paul Sterry and Barry Hughes. It was made for people who are beginners. That right. was the design. Um, and it's light, in, it's heavy, but it's light enough to carry it when you go out. Because okay. if you go out looking for fungi, uh, you need to know, do I need to smell it? What do I need to find out about it before I can find out in the book what it is? Okay. Okay, so just running through some more questions here. Nigel Jackman wants to know, what is your star fungus of Richmond Park? Of oh, Richmond Park. My star fungus. Oh, one he showed me the other day. Foliotis <laughs> barosa. <laughs> no, I guess my star fungus of all, the one that started me interesting in, to be interested in fungi, and I can't find a better picture, is this here. Blue-green, it's a stropharia, which I saw at Kew. 10 years ago, and I thought, I'm talking about trees, because I'm a guide at Kew, I'm talking about trees. What is that? It just looked like something from outer space. It was so beautiful and unusual. That's what started me being interested in fungi. Okay. So that really is my all time favorite. So um, Sarah Travers wants to know, uh, wants to know if all, all the fungi we've seen today in the videos, uh, or the video, I should say, our safari and the slides are all from Richmond Park? Yes. They're all yes. been spotted in Richmond yes. Park? Yes. The, the video of the um, bird's nest fungi I took at Kew, but I have seen them in the Pembroke Lodge Gardens on the soil okay. there. Now, Jacob Hankey, I don't know if it's Hankey or Hank, who's age six. So hello, Jacob, and thanks for joining us. It's great to see young naturalists coming on and, um, uh, and joining us and joining in the interest in things like fungi and the wildlife in the park. Jacob wants to know, he says he loved mushrooms. Um, are there any death cat mushrooms in the park? I think you've already said no, but he wants to know how can you recognize them? Uh, you need to get a book to <laughs> refer to so that you can look and understand what it looks like. Uh, and if you're at all unsure, there are, there's another false death cap, which looks very similar. You just don't touch it. So it's really knowing. And the best way, I think for children, it's not a case of saying, oh, don't touch them, they're poisonous. Most of them aren't. The majority of uh, fungi are not poisonous. But right. the best thing to do is get to know them. Is that, is that, I've got this one here, is that the death cap up there? Could well be, yes. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. in the, that book, the um, Funky Guide there. Which is an old fashioned book. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not the latest a, version. It's got a forward by Sir David, one of our patrons. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but that's, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a collector's item that, but you can still, you can get that on Amazon. I saw a copy there for 149, so rush to get it while you can. All right. No, buy a modern up-to-date one <laughs> yeah. because the names change. Uh, right. So with DNA, the names change. So buy an up-to-date book if you're going to spend your money. Okay, quick question here from Jenny Shalom. She says, uh, with the advent of so many tree diseases headed our way, how will mycorrhizal fungi be affected? Will the disease affect them? Good question. Sorry, tree diseases? Yeah, will the, will the tree diseases affect the mycorrhizal? Well, some of the tree diseases are fungal themselves, like um, uh, the, sudden, the elm disease, uh, that was caused by a fungus. The... Okay. Um, the uh, ash tree, that's a, ash dieback is a, a related close to a fungus. So will it affect the mycorrhizal fungi? It will. If a fungus likes to be associated with a certain tree like elm, the fungus might die out. 
but yeah. there's one that I showed in the video, a velvet shank. That used to be found mostly on elm, but now there aren't any elms, it has adapted and you're finding out on other trees. Okay. All right, we're going to move on because we got up there pouring in these questions. <laughs> Brian McDonald though has made a nice comment. He says that the, our, um, our webinar here has been better than Melvin Bragg's podcast on Fungi, which included several <laughs> professors. So there we go. Right, Judith Pearl wants to know, what's the difference between mycelia and roots? Another excellent question. Uh, plants have roots. Fungi have mycelium, hyphae and mycelium. Right. The only reason you might use the word roots in relation to fungi is to say, to explain to somebody, it's the equivalent of roots, right. if you like, um, okay. but they're completely different. Okay. Um, Judith Pearl wants to know, I'm throwing these at you now, you've got to, you're going to back them out, the, bash them out of the park. Judith Pearl wants to know, what's the difference between mushrooms and toadstools? Now, that is a good question. They're all fungi. They're There's all no fun difference fun. at all. So it's just different names that people Toadstool, have. Toadstool, tadstool comes from the German. Mushrooms comes from the French. They're right. all fungi. Okay, good. There's no, toadstools aren't poisonous and mushrooms edible. Forget that. Right. Just get to know your fungi. Okay. Uh, Marilyn Watkinson wants to know, can fungi kill a live tree? I think you've partly answered that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. some um, parasitic, like the giant polypore, can right. cause sufficient damage. But others, other some of the big bracket fungi, which we showed in the screen with the beech, they hollow out the inside of the tree, and the, the centre of the tree is effectively dead wood. The living part is on the under the bark. So... Uh, hollowing out the center is not a problem. The tree can live with that for years. And that hollowed center actually makes the tree structurally more strong, stronger. And, and, and it, the hollow center is a place where invertebrates and fungi live. So yeah. hollow trees are valuable. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a good point to make, a good point to make here, Janet, is to talk about how dead wood is so valuable in the park, really. For Absolutely. Forever. But dead, it's got to be damp, dead wood. Damp. Lie on the ground. Wood no, lying on the ground, not leaning up against a tree, because yeah. sadly also dens in the summer are a fire hazard because the wood dries out. And it's not only fungi that live in damp wood, it's bacteria and insects. They need moisture. We need water to live. Okay. So um, Vivian Press wants to remind people, now she is the editor, the excellent editor of our excellent newsletter, and she wants to point out that you have a two-page feature in the current newsletter, which obviously only goes to members. Absolutely. So again, a good reason to sign up for your membership <laughs> now. So thanks, Vivian, for that. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is a, ooh, quite a scientific question for this one for you to handle from Helen Corey. Does mycelium secrete enzymes to break down vegetable matter trapped in their network? Trapped in their network? I what suppose network? a network of roots, I would guess. Um, the, the, mycelium, the mycelium or the hyphae, the hyphae and are tubes. If yes. they join together, they, you call it mycelium they do exude outside of themselves enzymes. We digest food inside ourselves in our stomachs. Fungi digest food outside of themselves in the surrounding, whether it's wood, soil, insect, whatever. And then they reabsorb the broken down nutrients from whatever they've broken down, leaving some probably in the soil. That's how the soil is made. Going to stop you there because I can't get... Yeah, I think I think it'll it'll have to be. We'll have to do it in the sequel, okay, Janet? Okay. <laughs> uh, Felix Pring, another terrific question. Uh, edible fun with edible fungi, we typically eat only the fruiting bodies, i.e., what's above ground. Uh, are there any examples of people eating the hyphae and the mycelium underground? So it actually links into your previous question. Is that edible at all? What is corn? Corn is a filamentous fungi fungus. Yeah. Um, that is pretty well the mycelium and okay. that's grown on sugar substrate in large vats, extracted, dried, it's sort of raked off and then so that would be the nearest I think. Um, okay. Honeybees eat mycelium because of the 
enzymes that they get. And actually, actually somebody called Paul Stamets, he thinks that the bees eating the mycelium is helping them protect them against varroa mite. And he's working on that. It's an interesting thing to look up YouTube videos. Paul Stamets. He's a bit of a... Mm, um, Great I am. Great I am, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not saying anything to defame him in this, actually. Um, <laughs> Just uh, so quick, quickly running through some other comments on here. You've, you've already, you've, do you want to just show your field guide again, the field guide you were showing us because you said it was so good. We're getting quite a few people asking about it. So we're obviously stimulating a lot that of interest. That particular one, I, that was the first one I ever had. Colin, Colin's complete guide. Okay. Yes, and it's by Hughes and Sterry. Um, right. And it's not that expensive. Um, now the other one, Oh, much heavier. Roger Phillips. Right. Okay. Um, mushrooms. That's good. But this again, you've got spore shapes, spore measurements. So this is sort of the next stage when right. you've got your microscope. Um, it also has very good pictures. So you right. don't need to have a microscope. But I wouldn't take this out. I do sometimes, but I don't always take it out in the field because it's so heavy. So that's one. I mean, I've got a load behind me there. There's um, Andy Overall's book on the shelf. There's Dorling Kindersley. Uh, got other ones down there. Okay, Janet, let's just, sorry, I have to. I have to sorry, move. yeah. Oh, you've, you've, pop, you've got a very demanding public here. Um, we've got a few com quotes coming in, some are anonymous or questions coming in about identification, giving me verbal. Uh, clues, but I don't think we can really handle those here. I, what I suggest to those people sending in those types of questions, if you could send in, um, we have an info at uh, email address on our website. If you go to that and uh, email in any, if you have a photo or particular question on identification, that would be helpful uh, because it's very difficult to do. Um, With identification, I did think, I did start making a list of things that you need to look at, and I felt it was too incomplete. Right, okay. Again, you've got to, you go to a book like this or the or the other one, and at the beginning, it'll give you keys. I can get, well, I probably can't get to the page quickly. You get, you have keys where you look through the pictures um, and it helps, there's a picture of it, where it gives you groups of fungi and it helps you what to look for. So that's the, so it's get a good book Rather than I give you a list of what to look for, get a good book and follow the keys to help you. Okay. Somebody wants to know, and I, I don't blame them, I'd ask this question as well. Can you find truffles in Britain? You can in Britain. There's a chap in Wales has discovered them. I think he discovered them rather than he's growing them. And I know there's a project in northern Spain where people were leaving the area and there is the right sort of oak there and they've started farming truffles on the oaks and it's brought people back into the area because they can make a living. Okay. So they are mycorrhizal, so you can't necessarily say, I want you to grow here. You've got to Do have the right tree, the right soil, the right conditions. Do you need a pig to find them, a wild boar? <laughs> They, they, they actually give off the female, the female pig's pheromone to right. attract a pig okay. to come and pick them up. <laughs> well, but you well, can train dogs to look for them too. <laughs> I can't catch them up today. Okay, uh, what's the rarest fungus you've ever found in the park? In the park? Um, Amazing. Oh, oh, that. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, Polyporus quercinus. Um, is that the right word? Name. Um, it's a very old. It, it's a fungus that only grows on ancient oaks. Right. Richmond Park has them, and Windsor Great Park has them because Polyporus. they have old oaks. Polyporus quercinus because it's Quercus grows on oaks. Quercus right. quercinus. Uh, and I've seen that. But my most important one was a find, um, a tooth fungus, Hericium erinaceus, uh, which I found, and I was the first one to find it in Surrey. Oh, wow. wow. So my name is in the books. <laughs> name it after you. But that wasn't in Richmond Park, that was over near You Pur could Bright. have the Bostock Belit, couldn't you? 
I could, yeah. I've got to so, discover yeah. it first. You can't name a plant after yourself, though. No, Someone else has got to name it or a yeah. fungus. Go on. So, uh, Next question. Else, a question here. How is statin actually related to fungi? Oh, it, look it up online it is developed <laughs> from it is developed from a fungus they yeah. are the fungus is used in the process you know okay. i'm not a medical person but it certainly is based on fungi you know the fungus is the original sometimes the same with plant compounds um they find the, the scientists find the compound in either the plant or the fungus and they learn how to synthesize it okay. and then they can make it rather than continuing to use the fungus Right, I'm just going to ask one more question because I can see the clock's ticking around to 10.37 and we'll wind this up in just a moment. Um, what makes old bracket fungus so hard? Is it lignin? asks Jonathan Luckett. That's a very good question. I must look that up. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we've, managed, we've managed to catch um, you up. <laughs> I must look that up. I always like uh, the question I can't uh, answer. Um, <laughs> could be uh, fungi it could be or it might not be because that it's not a plant it might be chitin chitin is the substance which is the exoskeleton of insects and fungi are mo nearer, more nearly related to insects and animals and right. us than they are to plants so i doubt if fungi contain lignin therefore right. i would guess that it's chitin okay but that's a guess Okay, and what just one um, one last question here, which isn't really fungi related, but is do we, Manju uh, Satish wants to know, do we take people to volunteer? Oh, we certainly do. Um, and, uh, we, there's, um, we have a volunteer section on the website, just go to www.frp.org.uk and hit see volunteer on there. And there are a number of volunteering opportunities. So we're always, um, we're always happy to hear, hear from volunteers and we have an awful lot of volunteer, volunteers and as I said earlier Janet heads up the volunteers um, for the conservation work in the park. So right. something just popped up on the screen and yep. there's a Chinese person has contributed that the Chinese not only use a, a huge array of fungi for medicine they also eat a huge array of fungi and they have they're brilliant at growing them as well. Okay well, I think um, it's getting on for 11.40 now, and I, I need to have my brunch. Okay. I don't know about you, and I'm going to have some mushrooms with mine, I think, definitely. Um, so, so thank you very much, everyone, for your questions today. And um, it's very encouraging to so, see so many people involved today. I think we peaked around about 250, 260 who are actually online, 250, 260. That's fantastic. We, we're continuing these Zoom sessions. The next one... Um, will be the trees of Richmond Park with Simon Richards, the park manager, and Gillian Jonasus, who's Richmond Park's arboriculturist. That'll be on January the 23rd, uh, 2021, obviously, so look out for that. And as you know, we're talking about trees. This is, for the Friends of Richmond Park, it's been our year of the tree. So we've had, uh, if you don't know about it, again, go to the website, lots of great information about it, and of course, that is a wonderful piece of artwork uh, that was done for us of the Royal Oak. So finally, um, many thanks to the invisible team, uh, Roger Hillier and Xanthi Gialusi, who've been really helpful with uh, getting all the tech work uh, done today. And it's taken a lot of hassle off of us. So thank you so much uh, for your help. It's been fabulous. And, um, and of course, if you can do it, if you if you can if you can be heard at all, but certainly do it in your own rooms by your own laptops. Can you give a big warm round of applause to Janet Bostock for that fantastic presentation? Richard Gray for organising it. Well Thank done. <laughs> Joint effort. Just signing off now with everyone to say: remember to love and respect Richmond Park and its rich ecology. Uh, we're very very lucky to have such a wonderful place so close to us. It's a real privilege. So thank you everybody and goodbye.